When many people think of church, they think of a building that you go to on Sundays or Wednesdays. Some people think of the leaders who run the churches and then pick a church based on which leaders they like the most. Still others think church is a collection of programs that they are a part of, serve in, and attend. They're also told to invite their friends and encouraged to give their money and time to support the work that takes place in the building. The more committed they are, the more time and money they give. Eventually, they are taught how to use their spiritual gifts to build up the church in the programs or the building where the church meets. We believe it's important for the church to gather together regularly and for people to submit to leaders and be trained and equipped by them. And we do believe that we should gather regularly so people can be equipped and built up in Christ. But we also want to send people out into the world more and more. We want them to learn how to use their money to bless people outside of the church. We want them to begin using more and more of their time to serve the city where they live. We want them to use their spiritual gifts, not just so we can benefit, but so that our city can benefit as they use their gifts for the city's good. In all of this, our hope is that we will fill our city with the presence of Christ so that gospel saturation will take place and every man, woman, and child might have an opportunity to both hear and see the good news of Jesus through his people. Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet before, my name is Mike King, and I'm one of the pastors here. And just out of curiosity, are there any other men who are kind of flying solo today with their kids because their wives are out at the coast? Good for you. Hey, I, mean, I, I mean, I come in by myself pretty early every Sunday morning. I have no idea how my wife gets our kids here every week. We were, it was, we're here this morning, but kind of running on fumes some days. So uh, anyway, I hadn't planned on saying that. Uh, it, so the video that we just watched <laughs> raised some ideas that we are going to spend some time digging into together today. So this morning, we're continuing on in a teaching series that we're calling This Is Us. And uh, the basic idea behind the series is simple. We're just stopping and looking at some of the practices and beliefs that we as followers of Jesus do that, you know, are part of what make us us, you know, make us who we are as we follow God. So we're talking about things in the series like baptism and communion and giving and praying and singing. And we're sort of just trying to decide why is it that we do these things? Why are they such a big part of our life? Uh, because if you didn't grow up in the church or if you haven't been part of a church, you kind of look in from the outside and these seem like sort of strange things for us to spend our time working on. Um, but for those of us who've done these things for years, my hope is that in talking about these topics, we can kind of understand them in a new way or a deeper way, and then really sort of recommit to fully engaging with them. And for those of us who might be new to the faith or the church, well, I hope that this series gives you some information on why we do these things, but also provides an invitation to, to kind of try these out for yourself and see how God might work in your life as you do these things. And today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about giving. And the story that we're going to look at really specifically has to do with financial giving, kind of giving money. But when we talk these ideas about giving, I really want you to think about giving in a broader term, kind of like what we saw in that video. It's not just about giving money. It's really about giving your time and your energy and your experience and all that you have, uh, because that's part of what followers of Jesus to do, are called to do. We're called to give all of those things away and invest them in other people so that they can thrive and so that our city can thrive. And that really is kind of countercultural. That's not something that you hear as much in the world around us, especially this financial piece, right? We encourage people to give away a pretty decent chunk of the money that they earn so that we can see God's purposes done in them and through them. So to get into this idea of giving, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Uh, if it would help you for any reason, there's some red Bibles in the seats around you. You can grab one of those and turn to the page number that's listed there on the screen. But the passage that we're going to be looking at uh, was written by a man named Luke. So Luke wrote two different books that we have in the New Testament. One of them, the Gospel of Luke, is a biography of Jesus. It kind of tells the story of his life. And then the second one, the book we're looking at today, the book of Acts, kind of tells the history of the early church and how this, these first followers of Jesus, how that movement began to grow and develop and change. So let's dig into this passage starting with verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias... 
how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You haven't just lied to human beings, you've lied to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Yeah, I bet it did. <laughs> uh, then some young men came forward, and they wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened, right? Because you couldn't text message each other all day long back then. So she didn't know what was going on. And Peter asks her, tell me, is this dollar amount, is this price, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out too. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And in what has got to be one of the greatest understatements in the Bible, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Now, isn't that just a wonderful text to talk about when a sermon about giving? I got to tell you, it took me like 30 seconds to write the first draft of this sermon. It went like this. Friends, Ananias and Sapphira didn't give enough of their money to God, so he killed them. And if you don't pony up and dig deep, he may be coming for you next. So get out your checkbooks and we'll sing a final song. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's actually not a sermon that you should preach from this text. Although my guess is there probably have been some of those over the years. You may have heard some of those. But really, if that's the point that you get out of this story, you're really kind of misinterpreting the text. You're, you're misunderstanding what it tries to say. But it is totally understandable why you would do that. Because this is a really hard text to understand. I mean, on its surface, it really does look like God killed them because they didn't give him enough money. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is just talk a little bit about what's actually going on in this story. To really kind of dig in and focus on what it actually teaches us about money and giving and, and how that should apply to our lives. And again, what we're talking about here is money, but I want you to kind of broaden that out because I think the, the lessons and principles we're pulling from this... It applies to how we give our time and our energy and our effort, how we choose to invest in relationships with others, all those things. Um, but I think to really understand what's going on in Acts chapter 5, you have to sort of back it up a little bit. So I want us to read just the very end of Acts chapter 4. So Acts chapter 4 ends with this amazing description of sort of the unity and the power that the early church was experiencing kind of in its earliest weeks. And it says this, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. They shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now, that's really kind of an amazing picture of how the people at the church provided for each other and, and gave sacrificially so that the mission could move forward. But that's sort of a, a general picture. This is what's going on in general, Luke says. And then he gives us a really specific example of how one person did that. So he talks about this guy. He says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I think Luke is bringing Barnabas up here because he's going to become a fairly influential leader in the early church. So this is a way for him to introduce him to his readers. But it's interesting that this is how he chooses to introduce him, as someone who is generous with his resources, as someone who is willing to invest them so that he can see the church's mission move forward. And now here is where Ananias and Sapphira's story enters the scene. Because right after you read the story about Barnabas, you go to the next chapter and you read about them. And you have to remember that the chapters and the verse divisions, like going from four to five, those weren't part of the original text. Those got added later, much later to, to kind of help us not get lost and to find certain passages. So if you're reading this for the first time, you're reading along, you say, oh, they gave everything, you read Barnabas' example, and then immediately you hit the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And I think Luke is putting those two things together on purpose, right? Because he wants us to compare them and he wants us to see the difference there. So let's take a look at how their story begins. So they also, right, have a piece of property, just like Barnabas, which they sell. But they do something, it says in verse 2, that Barnabas didn't do. So it says, Ananias, who has his wife's full knowledge in this, he keeps back part of the money for himself. But he brought the rest of it and put it at the feet of the apostles. And then I think what happens next is just kind of terrifying, right? Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? 
what made you think of doing such a thing? You haven't lied to men. You lied to God. And when Ananias heard this, Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. So again, so what, what's going on here? It really is easy to look at this text and think, oh man, God killed him because he didn't give him all the money. But that's really not what the text says. I mean, if you read it carefully, if you look at verse 4, Peter makes it very, very clear that the money was Ananias's. He could do with it what he wanted to. He said, didn't it belong to you before you sold the land? After it was sold, wasn't at your disposal? Right? You can do with it what you want. It's not like there's a secret rule in the early church that says every time you sell something, you got to get every single cent of it to the church. So the answer, I think, to this sort of tricky thing, it really lies in the question that Peter asks him. He says, what made you do, think of doing such a thing? Right? If you think about it, that is a question that gets at motivation. Right? Ananias, what was your motivation in doing this? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What pushed you to make this decision? It gets at a question about what's going on in the heart of Ananias and Sapphira. And again, you really can tell that there's sort of a heart problem going on here when you look at the text. Because in the first verse, there's this word that says they kept back some of the money. Well, the word there that, that is translated as kept back, it can also be translated as embezzle, right? Ananias and Sapphira, why did you embezzle some of your own money? I mean, it doesn't even make sense to say that, right? You can't, I don't think you can actually embezzle money from yourself. But Luke is using this word because that word is kind of loaded with meanings of, you know, intentionally deceiving people, of, of something that's not quite all above board. He's using that word to try to say, hey, they are up to something with their money. And what they're up to something is not good. So what is it they're up to? Right? You go back to that question that he asked for a moment. What made you do, think of doing such a thing? You know, the first time you read that question, you may say, okay, what he's asking about is what made you think that you could hold back part of the money for yourself? Again, I don't think that's what he's asking. He's not talking about their decision to, to not give all of the money. Apparently, what they did is they sold it, they kept some of it, but then they gave the money to them. They said, this is everything we got for it, right? They lied about the money, and that's what Peter is asking about. That's what he's calling him on. It's not keeping back some of the money that was theirs. That would have been okay to do, but he says that their sin is lying to the Holy Spirit, and it's lying to, the, to their brothers and sisters in the church that they were in this community that they were on mission with. You know, Peter's asking them, what made you think you should do that? What were you thinking? What are you getting at? And it's a good question to wrestle with. I mean, what, what did make them think they should do that? What was their motivation in that? I mean, if I had to make a guess as to why they did it, I would guess it, that they did it because they were filled with this desire for recognition. Right, Barnabas had just given away all of the money that he got for the land, and, and he was, that was an encouraging thing for people. He was held in some esteem for that. And I, my guess is they wanted to be recognized in the same way that Barnabas was recognized, right? As someone who, who really sacrificed support, sacrificially to, to support the mission. They wanted the praise and the esteem and the honor that he got, but they didn't want to make the sacrifice that he had to make, right? The way that they're using the money, the way that they're talking about how they're using the money, is really bringing to light the motivation of their heart. And what was in their heart was pride, was a desire to be seen and recognized and applauded by other people, the desire for that status, and that's what gets them into trouble. And I really do think, looking at the story, that that is at least one really, really valuable lesson that we can pull from this kind of strange story that certainly applies to our life today. Because there are a lot of things that have changed from the, the days when the apostles lived to when we're living today, but there's one thing at least that hasn't changed. The way we spend money today sure does tell us a lot about what's going on in our heart and in our priorities. That was true back then, and that is absolutely true for us today. And when Jesus talks about money, that's actually one of the central points that he returns to over and over and over again. This idea that the way you use your money tells something about your heart. Remember, Jesus is the one who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I really think it's interesting, you know, Jesus talks about money quite a bit. In fact, in the, the other book that Luke wrote, the biography of Jesus that we call Luke, in just about every single chapter in that book, Jesus talks about money at some point. It, it's an idea he comes back to time and time again. But here's the thing. I don't think Jesus is talking about money because he wants to empty our wallets. Uh, Jesus talks a lot about money because he wants to transform our hearts. Right? That's his goal, right? He wants us to allow his grace and power to change us from the inside out so that we can live the full free lives that he created us to live, so that we can be fully alive with him. And Jesus just knew 
that there is a real connection between our heart and our wallet. He knew that the way that we use our money is oftentimes a really good barometer for what's going on in our heart. That looking at our checkbook is really a way to, to measure you know, how the renovation of our heart and how our growth and maturity and discipleship is coming along. And honestly, I think the same thing could be said about our calendar, right? The way that we choose to invest our time, the people we choose to invest in or not invest in, the causes that we choose to give our energy and expertise or that we choose not to, right? That is a reflection of our heart and of our priorities. And this may not be necessarily a fun thing to hear, but it's an important thing to hear. Because Jesus' ultimate goal, right, he wants to transform our hearts so that as we become fully alive in him, we can be fully on mission with him. And that mission is to see our world transformed through his love and his grace. And that's why Jesus kept inviting people over and over again to give away their money. And that's why we as a church continue to encourage you to grow in this discipline of giving. Not because we want something from you. It's because we want something for you. We want the absolutely the same thing for you that Jesus wanted for you. We want you to be fully alive in him. And Jesus just knows that as we give, that frees something up in us and helps us do that. And if you have never given before, or that's not been a part of your life and your discipline giving financially, but it's something that you think, okay, maybe to obey Jesus, maybe the next right step is to start to give. But you are skeptical of my motivations, right? And get it, you might be. I mean, churches don't always have a good reputation when it comes to money. So if you're skeptical... I think that's probably legitimate. But I'll make you the same offer that I've made from up here before. If you feel like you want to start giving to God to see how that works in your life, but you're not sure you can trust us as a church because you think we're after our money, give your money to another church. Right? Keep coming here. Keep giving your money and investing it in God's kingdom work. I'll give you a list of wonderful churches here in town that I would be happy for you to give money to for six months while you see what it is that God does in your heart. Because this is not about your relationship with us. This is about your relationship with him and what it is that he wants to do in you, and what he wants to do through you. So with that in mind, here's an exercise that I want to encourage and suggest that you all do this week. Um, I would love for each of us to take some time to do this either alone, or you know, if you're married, you can do this with your spouse, you could do it with a parent. If you're really comfortable, you've got a friend you really trust, you could do this with them. But just take some time this week and sit down with them with your checkbook, and just say, look at how I spend my money, and just let me know what you see. What does this really reflect about my heart? What does this really reflect about my priorities? And do do the same thing with your calendar, right? Sit down and look through it and think, how am I choosing to invest my time? And what does that truly say about what's important to me? Not, Not what I say is important to me, but what actually is important to me, right? When you're a parent of young kids, what's really important to you? Is it spending time with your family? Well, if you look at your Netflix browsing history and you just been watched six seasons of, I don't know, The Sopranos or something, well, maybe that's not really what's most important to you, right? Are, are you putting your money, are you putting your calendar where your mouth is and where your priorities are and where your heart is? And this is something that my wife Martha and I have tried to do often over the years. We really do try to work to make sure that our time and our money are spent on the things that really line up with the priorities that we feel like God is calling us to, to be the priorities of our life. And this is not a one-time conversation. It's not like you do this once and you're set. Uh, You know, Rod, as he was uh, setting up communion, he mentioned that uh, over the course of his life, right, the the, the mix of how much time and money and energy he had, those things have have shifted. And as a result of that, what God has called him to do has shifted and how he's called him to serve and engage has shifted. And that's a conversation we have to continue to be in, right? Because life changes sometimes. You know, you get a job, you lose a job, you get kids, they move out. So the question you've always got to be asking is in this season, in this moment right now, What has God given me? And how is God calling me to invest that right now? And those those are challenging questions to have to ask. But they're important questions to ask, right? Because if we're really serious about being responsible with the mission God has given us and responsible with the gifts that he has given us, we have to be committed to letting our wallets and our calendars and our whole life be transformed. So I just would encourage you this week to, to do this exercise and just be open to listening to what God might want to say to you in that process. And while we're talking about money in churches, let me clear up one other misconception. I've I've honestly been a little surprised over the years, not just here, but at different churches that I've worked in, at how many people will come up to me and they just assume that because I'm a pastor at the church, I know how much money they give the church. Uh, Different churches do their accounting stuff differently, and especially in small churches, a lot of times the pastor does know because 
he's the only one there, right? He's counting the offering, he's making the deposits, he's doing the tax receipts, all that kind of stuff. But I just want you guys to know that the way things work here at Suburban, nobody up here at Suburban knows how much you give, except for the people who make the deposits and send out those tax receipts at the end of the year, right? And one of the reasons that we've chosen to structure it that way is because we really do want to try to emphasize that what you give is not about your relationship with me. It's not even about your relationship with the church. It is a heart issue between you and God, right? And, and how that plays out is between you and him. So we even sort of structure ourselves in a way that, that tries to, to keep the emphasis where it should be on how God wants to transform your heart by transforming the way that you use your money. And there's one other question that always comes up when you talk about this story. So I think it's good to take a moment and talk about it now. And that's this. Sometimes people look at the story and they're like, God, no offense, but aren't you kind of overreacting here? I mean, it, how is it that the God of grace decided to just kill this man and this woman? I mean, that doesn't seem very gracious, does it? Well, let me try to answer the question about why I think he did that by telling you a story. Um, so I have one sister. I've got one older sister, Tammy, who lives in Jersey and works in Manhattan for ABC. Now, if I decided I wanted to get in a car and visit her, let's see, Google Maps tells me that it would take me 44 hours to drive those 2,901 miles. Uh, you know, you go out to I-5, take a left, you hit I-84 and take a right, and I guess just like keep going until you hit the ocean. Um, but, so it's a long, long trip. But as my wife Martha could tell you, I'm not always the best when it comes to directions and things like that. So in a 2,900 mile road trip, I can almost guarantee you that at some point I am going to make at least one wrong turn. But here's the thing, making a wrong turn doesn't matter all that much if I make the wrong turn 2,899 miles into the trip somewhere in lower Manhattan. Right? It might take me a couple of minutes longer to get where I'm going, but at least I'm in the neighborhood. But what happens to my trip if I make a wrong turn on I-5? Right? Instead of going north, I go south, I drive all day. You know where I am at the end of the day? I am in the Mojave Desert in the middle of California, right? I am farther away from New York at the end of the day than I was when I started. Because the, the sort of simple point of that story is this, it's really important to make the right turns at the beginning of a trip, right? If you make the right turn at the beginning of the trip, you're in good shape. Make the wrong turn out of your driveway, you can really end up in the wrong place. And that's, I think, what's going on in this story. Remember, the church is just very, very brand new. This whole Jesus movement, he's just gone back to heaven a few weeks before this. The church is just beginning its journey together. And God knows, he knows just how off course they might go if they don't make the correct turns coming out of the gate, right? In terms of their finances, in terms of the way they talk to each other, are they going to be honest with each other or not? In terms of their pride and how they choose to deal with that. So I think what you see here is you see God following a pattern that you see all throughout Scripture, which is that at the beginning of something new, God tends to judge sin both very publicly and very harshly, right? Very publicly and very harshly to make sure that this new work gets started in the right direction. So on the surface, this absolutely looks severe, and it is severe. But I actually think it's actually the severe mercy because God knows, in the words of that hymn that we just sang together, how prone to wander we all are. We're prone to wander at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the journey that we're on. So put yourself in Luke's shoes, right? You've written the story. He just sort of pins the word, you know, they're dead, and great fear seizes everybody. And he thinks, i got to do something to try to encourage these people at this point. You know, everybody that's reading it is like, well, this is like the worst story ever. So instead, what Luke does next is he, he sort of follows up with some of the consequences of that decision, uh, what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. And he says, you know, let's look at what happens next in the life of the church. So he says this. He says, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. You skip down a little bit. It says, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. And all of them were healed. Right, Luke, he, he kind of holds up this story as a way to say, do you see, do you see what can happen when our hearts are moving together in the right direction? Do you see what God can do in us? Do you see what God can do through us when we're fully alive in him, when we're fully invested in this, when we're fully engaged in this mission that he has given us to carry the power of his spirit to a broken world? I think that this last little bit of the story here, these verses are meant as an encouragement for every church that reads it, including us to remind us that the way 
to move forward in mission is to keep surrendering every part of our lives, our wallets, our calendars, our time, the, the relational bandwidth and energy that we have to see his mission get done. And with that idea, right, we're kind of, kind of back full circle to that video that we started with. But one of the things that I appreciate about that video is it doesn't talk about giving in terms of money. It talks about it in terms of our money and our time and our energy and our expertise and the voice that we can have in other people's lives. And it talks about all of that in light of the mission that God has given us. Because we've got one, right? Jesus, as he was preparing to leave, he said, hey, just as God sent me into the world, now I'm sending you into the world. Right? My job was to come and help people see that they can be fully alive in me. Now your job is to go and help other people see that. And what that video reminds us of is that we can contribute to that mission in many, many ways. The Christian life is really all about mission. And when you have got a mission that is as important as ours, you do what the early church did. They, they, they spared no quarter, right? I mean, they, they made sure that every decision they made, they tried to get every single part of their lives lined up so that it was all moving towards seeing God get this mission done. And for the first church, every part of their life was impacted by this idea of stewardship, of being responsible with what God had given them, of not just saying, you know, we've been blessed and we keep this to ourselves and this is good for us, but realizing that God has indeed blessed us so that we can share that with other people. That's what he is calling us to do. See, as Christians, we don't really give. You know, we don't give away money. Really what we do is we invest money, and we invest our time, and we invest our energy. We invest our experience. We invest our voice in other people and other causes so that we can see God's mission move forward. To finish up today, we're going to sing a final song together to, to kind of help us sort of put some of these ideas in heart. So as Randy and the musicians come forward, um, I just want to leave you guys with some really practical things to do. I'm going to give you sort of three steps that you can take to kind of move this from your head out to your hands and actually do something with this this week. And, and I want you to sort of figure out what works for you. This is, this is an all play, right? This is something that you can do whether you follow Jesus for a long, long time or whether you're, you're brand new and you're not even sure what you think about all of this. So you can do all three of these things this week. You can pick the one or the two that, that kind of best meets where you are. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is do that audit, right? Spend some time alone or with somebody you trust, with your checkbook and with your calendar, and just say, okay, God, what does this really say about where my heart is? What does this really say about where my priorities are? And then I just pray that as you do that, you would, you would listen. You would be open to hearing what it is that he wants to share with you in that process. Uh, the second thing I would encourage you to do is to really dig into the daily readings that we have for this week. On the back of this Take 5 sheet, there's just a number of different passages that talk about this idea of really investing all that we have, our gifts, our money, our time, our energy, all those things to see God's work get done in us and through us. And if you're new or if you're sort of exploring the faith and you have never read these passages before, I think you will be absolutely blown away at what God promises to do in us and through us as we, we give these things over to him. And if you've been following Jesus for a long time, there are some wonderful reminders in here that I think all of us need on a regular basis of what God's calling us to do and of the incredible privilege that he gives us to be a part of things as we respond to him. And then the last thing, if it works out for your schedule, I would really encourage you to join our family in CityServe this Saturday. As Rick mentioned earlier, it's an opportunity to tangibly serve our community, to do the kind of things that we saw in that video. We're partnering with the Parks and Recreation Department and local schools and local nonprofits to just go out and really work for the good of our city in the name of our Lord. So giving, right, responding to what God has done, it's not just about giving your money. It could be about giving your time this Saturday morning. And if you've got a busy life and, you know, you can't commit to serving someplace regularly, this could be a wonderful way to just get your toe in the water. You give us a few hours on Saturday morning and just, just see what God does in that. See if that doesn't wake up some part of you and help you be a little bit more fully alive in him. So as we prepare to, to sing this song, let me pray for you. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for what you do in us. Thank you for what you do through us. God, we recognize that as 21st century people who live in America, we, we have just been blessed. I mean, we won the lottery in terms of when we were born. We have access to more resources, more education, and more opportunities than most people who have walked on this earth in history have ever had. And yet, God, we just believe at the core of, the, of your story is that when we receive things like this, when we have the good fortune of being blessed like this, you did not give that to us just because you like us more than you like other people. But instead, you have blessed us so that we can turn around and use what we have to bless others. 
So God, as we sing this song, I just pray that you would help us know what it looks like to take all of us, all of our life, and see it transformed into what you want it to be. Give us each eyes to know what you are calling us to do today, and then give us the guts to actually begin to do it this week. And as we do that, Lord, we trust we will see amazing things happen in your power. Amen.